All right, hello and welcome to another Sales Expert Insight. And today I'm joined with uh, by Anthony Steers, who's in the UK today. Hey, Anthony. Hello, hello. How are yeah. you? My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And what I love about today's interview is Anthony is called, well, it's a bit scary actually, because he's called the telephone assassin. Um, so uh, I have to watch myself here. Um, <laughs> but what I'm, I'm really looking forward to is the fact that Anthony is somebody who really believes that you can still call people on the telephone. You can still actually drive new leads and upsell. Um, so let's get straight into it, Anthony. When you say telephone assassin, what do you mean? <laughs> if I'm honest with you, it's kind of a, a nickname I picked up when I first started my company 12 years ago. I used to make calls for lots of different businesses. Uh, and I always used to say they'd try and give me databases. And I would say, don't give me a database, just give me a wish list. Mm -hmm. um, I don't need a huge database. Just tell me the top 10, 20 companies that if you got them on board would make a massive difference and that I'll go after them. So, yeah. Oh, two of the clients ended up saying to me, oh, you're like my telephone assassin, and it kind of stuck. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it became the name of the of the company when I began sort of training and doing more speaking. And then when I met Phil Jones, who I believe you guys yeah, uh, do, mm -hmm. um, he encouraged me to write the book uh, and stuff as well. So it's, it's kind of stuck. You may notice from the website and anybody who's yeah. seen the book, it's rather pink. <laughs> Apparently, the, the pink softens the aggression in the word assassin, but... Um, <laughs> Oh, yes, it, so it's amusing because the word assassin, people tend to think that this is going to be aggressive sales tactics. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's nothing like that at all. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So the pink, the pink telephone assassin even. There you go. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, about cold calling, right? Because as, as we were saying just before we came on air, you know, it's a subject that a lot of people like to say, well, cold calling's dead, you know, uh, or they just want to avoid it in any way they can. And obviously, there's been a whole inbound movement where it's all about inbound marketing and, you know, don't even bother picking up the phone. So why do you take a, an alternate view and saying that it actually does still work, but it works differently, right? It, yeah, definitely still works. Um, we know it works because we all now wander around with our own personal phone rather than just having a landline. So we do like it. Most people like to spend a lot of time on Facebook and looking busy um, and don't always use it as a telephone. But you can still get hold of people. Um, it should certainly be done. Obviously, if you can drive inbound, that's fantastic. I mean, over half of the stuff I do is helping clients with inbound calls. So either account management or customer service. And it's about trying to convert those quicker and getting more value out of all of them. Um, the reason why I think you should still do this is that um, most of us like it when we get referrals. And I meet lots of accountants and they say, I built my business on referrals. And you think, well, that, that's why you've stayed quite small, because what you're basically doing is you, you're you, you, you need to do some good work uh, and then hopefully that person is going to bump into somebody else who has a problem that you could fix and they're going to say, aha, I know somebody, you should speak to them. Whereas what I get people to do is basically collect testimonials and have case studies of clients that you've done really well with and go and share that with people who can relate to it. So, um, yeah, if you share a success story that somebody can relate to, you'll get their attention. Um, and the approach to cold calling now, people go, oh, you do telesales. Well, it's not really telesales because you're not really selling down the phone. Right. Half the time you're trying to cultivate a relationship with somebody and get an opportunity to go and meet them and have a face to face meeting. Um, so if you approach people with the right attitude uh, over the telephone, most people are really receptive. So one tip I give everybody is at the beginning of every call, you have to get permission to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and many of us do that. We'll phone up and say, hey, are you free to speak for a minute? Are you OK to talk? Something along those lines. Um, I kind of take it to the next level. I phone people up and assume it's a bad time. So I just go, hey, there, I was hoping to chat to you for a couple of minutes, but I'm assuming now's perhaps not the best time. Is there a better time to call you back? And it's beautiful because you don't set off any alarm bells that say that this is a sales call. And yeah. the first thing they're thinking is, you've made this so easy for me to get out of this call. You're either not in sales or you're <laughs> rubbish at it, basically. Um, and they're intrigued. And it's beautiful because you, you end up with people who are too busy. And I think we've all phoned somebody sure. who isn't paying attention or is in the middle of something else. Um, if you give people an opportunity to say, look, actually, you're right, now isn't a good time, they'll just say, yes, can you call me back on Friday at three o'clock? And you can book it in. And they've asked you then to call back. And right. it doesn't feel as cold. But the beauty of it is, is you're, people are surprised at how many people will say, 
well, go on then, I've got two minutes now, what's the call about? Right, right. And the beauty of that is you've, you've created intrigue into why you have called as opposed to interest in what you're calling about. Right. And that's the hardest thing on the phone is, getting, is making somebody listen so that, that you engage with them. And it sounds like from that approach, as you say, you've taken some of the defensiveness out of it, right? Because, you know, uh, you, you know what it's like sometimes when the phone rings and we pick it up by accident because we didn't check the number properly and it's, uh, <laughs> it's you know, it's, ah, it's a salesperson. But you've taken yep. some of that defensiveness out of it by just having a more elegant approach, right? Yeah, the, the kind of analogy I tend to give people is it's a bit like dropping off a pizza menu. Uh, and what I mean by that is in the UK in particular, we get takeaway menus put through our door every day that land on our mat. Mm -hmm. um, but I always ask people, have they ever knocked on your door and asked to take an order? Right. And everybody usually laughs and kind of goes, well, no. And I go, yeah, because that would be really rude. Now, that's how a lot of salespeople come across on the phone. They interrupt your day and then kind of want you to just buy something from them. Mm -hmm. And actually, what you want to do is to say to people is, look, I'm, this is what we do. I'm assuming you're not looking for this right now. But I'd love to give you a reason to remember me so that if in the future you need our services, that perhaps I could offer you a little test drive. Yeah. And then you design. So basically, the, the thing that I always say, there's three really simple steps or principles to being on the phone is you need to build three things. The first thing is rapport. And you do that by being really polite uh, right. because most salespeople can be a, or some salespeople can be a bit abrupt. So you've got to build rapport. Then you've got to build credibility. So you use your case studies and your testimonials of clients just like them so that they know you've helped people like them before. And then you create urgency by creating a test drive that they can't say no to. And that could be a face-to-face -face meeting. It, in the insurance world, it's giving them a quote. Mm -hmm. but, but So I think you mentioned before, uh, well, I, I've worked with a few insurance companies. Yeah. And yeah. I ask everybody, what's the one crucial bit of information that an insurance company wants to know from you when they first meet you as a potential client? And basically, it's your renewal date. Right. Because if you've right. just renewed your insurance, you do not want to talk to anybody about it for another nine or ten months. <laughs> so that's fine. You just once you understand their desired time frames, you can put them in the pipeline. You can drip feed them if you want to set up automated emailers and send them case studies every six weeks, just so that you're building on the credibility. But you then strike when the iron's hot, as opposed to trying to force a conversation that people aren't ready to have yet. And that's where I think a lot of salespeople go wrong. So it seems to me then that the that the real key to all of this then is in having number one a system and a process and then doing some preparation. Also, as we discussed earlier, it's it's this idea of you know when people think of cold calling, they often think of somebody having a list, right? And maybe now they've got a piece of technology too where you just dump all the numbers into it and it just dials and you sit there and you go, "Hi, can I speak to hi?" And <laughs> and it's that kind of like volume, just crunch through the volume. But really what you're saying is that it's all about the preparation and the process, right? That it's not really a cold call if you put enough preparation into it. My rule to making phone calls is, is don't count your calls, just make calls that count. Mm -hmm. If you dial 100 times and you rattle off a pitch and get hung up on and people saying no, you've, you're wasting data. You're running the risk of upsetting somebody who has perhaps a big following online who's then going to start saying bad things about you. Um, and each no is not one step closer to your next yes. It's a, it's a sign that perhaps you're phoning the wrong people or taking the wrong approach. That, so, yeah, so what would you say then, okay, how would you prepare, how would you, Anthony, prepare for a call to me if you didn't know me? What would you do in advance? Uh, so typically, you tend to have a little look on uh, LinkedIn. It's obviously a great place to start. And what I always say to people is a, a lot of people get interviews with companies mm -hmm. based on the fact that they send their CV in. And that's mm -hmm. because somebody looks at your CV, they make some judgments on what sort of person you are, your track record, and then invites you in. LinkedIn profiles are basically glorified C, uh, CVs with a bit of social on it. So yeah. it's very easy to figure out. So the example I always give is, I've worked for lots of IT companies in the past, and sometimes you sell IT through an IT manager. Sometimes it's it's more through like an FD or an MD or an FD who signs off the checks. Now, an IT manager wants to know about whether it's going to integrate with their existing systems. They're going to want to know if they have to do patching for maintenance. They want to know how you're going to help train their staff, all this kind of stuff. Whereas an FD wants to know when they're going to get their return on investment. How is it going to improve efficiencies? Um, they might not talk about training, but talk about culture change because mm -hmm. they think a bit more bigger picture. Sure. But the point I'm trying to make is you would have two very different conversations with these two people, but you're still selling the same service to the same company. 
And actually, you've just got to do a bit of research first to try and figure out what buttons to press, uh, what case studies and success stories you can use that are going to resonate with people. Right. Uh, and yeah. No, I was saying that's a, that's that's good because I think, as you say, I think people sometimes, you know, they have a pitch and they don't realize that, and especially today in, in business to business sales, there's often, quite frankly, more than one person involved in the purchasing decision anyway. And as yep. you say, they care about different things. A right? financial person obviously cares about the, the, the finances and the, the return on investment. Um, the mm -hmm. line manager, you know, cares about the efficiency of it. Uh, so, yep. uh, as you say, it's different yep. things for different people. So, obviously, the research component is, is essential and also figuring out, okay, if I get passed to someone else, I better have, uh, yep. I better have prepared for that too. Yeah, I, don't get me wrong. You, the research isn't always an absolute necessary. But what I tend to find is the more research people have done, the more confident they're going to approach, they're going to sound when they talk to people. Um, it's lovely when you know you've got a few bits of ammunition up your sleeve and you've got various case studies. And so when I use case studies and testimonials, I tend to say you tend to group them by industry because that shows you've worked in that industry before, but then also by the job title of the person who's written it because directors use different language from marketing people and finance people. So actually, you can start to pull out the aces that you need to win them over and prove that you do know what you're talking about. And the beauty of it as well is that it stops you having to cringe and tell them how good you are. <laughs> let, your, let, your, let your clients do it for you. It, it, it's so much more comfortable. Um, and you've you got to be careful not to I think a lot of people like to show off and they sometimes try and do name dropping and they try and mention their biggest clients, sure. which is really good for your stature. But quite often that can actually intimidate people. Yeah. So I, I can turn around and say, yeah, I've done stuff for Bakeweights, BT, Microsoft. But if I'm talking to a small, a small little company, then they're going to be thinking, well, God, I haven't got that kind of budget or my exactly. team's only got three people in it. And, and it can kind of almost work against you. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And I think it also give, helps gives people a bit of strategy. So I would try and refer to, I, I mentioned it earlier on, I don't do database marketing, it's wish list marketing. Right. But it's what I refer to as being kind of sniper sales. Mm -hmm. Like literally start with your case studies and your good clients where you've got a great track record. Document it and then go and share that with other people in that industry. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great, that's a great uh, other ta uh, key takeaway because I have seen this in the past myself. I've, I've actually witnessed it live, <laughs> is where somebody uses the wrong reference or case study, as you say, and the other company. Because I remember, I, 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 this is a true story. One time, a long time ago, I was with somebody on a sales call and the company actually were in rocks as in rocks, like, you know, stone, different size of stones and stuff. That's what they dealt yep. in. And the the salesperson talked about the work they had done with a medical devices company. And literally, the one of the people <laughs> in the room literally said, but we sell rocks. <laughs> and it was a, and it was a hard comeback from there you know because and as you say uh you know we kind of had set it up or the person had set it up wrong um so i like that idea of looking at who you are talking to and then using the appropriate case study or testimonial to go with it so if it's a small company uh, you know a similar small company if large large um so again i yeah. like that idea that there's there's a lot of thought still going into this right yeah so the way i would Phrase it, if I, if I do have to do really short talks on stage, I just say the best way to perfect your pitch is to share a success story that somebody can relate to. Yeah. Yeah. So find out what your stories are, find out who might be interested in that story and have a patient approach that when you interrupt their day with a phone call that they're not, it, it's not feeling like you're knocking on the door and trying to take an order. You're literally just dropping off your pizza menu. Yeah. So if you had a couple of pieces of advice for anyone listening who maybe is, you know, stuck cold calling today, not having success, banging their head off their phone or mm -hmm. monitor or whatever, yeah. what are a couple of pieces of advice you have where they could start to maybe change things up a little? Okay. Um, 
like I said, I, I always start with the credibility piece. You need to prove that you're credible in whatever it is you're going to try and do or sell to somebody. So start off by looking at your existing customer bases um, and, and get some more testimonials and case studies. Beauty of this is it gives you some great bits of ammunition, but it gives you a nice positive association with being on the phone. It will inflate your ego because your clients are going to tell you how wonderful you are. You can ride that little buzz all week and share that success story with as many people as you can kind of come across. Going out there with that up your sleeve, you, you feel much more prepared. Um, so then what I would do is now I've got my success story, look at who it is I want to target, create a wish list of 20, 30, no more than 50 at most um, and do a little bit of research um, look people up on LinkedIn obviously you check out their about me page mm -hmm. you check out their blogging about that kind of stuff and just start to build a picture of who they are and what actually might float their boat and, and what angles you should take because if I know somebody's worked in insurance in the past and I'll mention insurance references because I know that they'll get it straight away sure. um, so yeah it's just about using the ammunition at the right time um, the other thing as well is just have a conversation. Don't deliver a pitch. Um, don't have a script at all. Um, that's not going to help. Um, just get permission to speak at the beginning of the call. Collect up as many objections as you physically can because the middle, the next part of the call is them telling you why they don't want to do it yet and you just need to accept that because uh, generally objection handling is basically arguing. So if you do it on a first call, you tend to win the argument and then they feel <laughs> defeated. It doesn't really work. You're better off actually gathering them up so that the second time you phone them, you've got more case studies and you put their objection down on the table first. And then it's very easy to get, well, it's then very easy to get around it because you brought it up. So yeah. when I worked for the IT companies, the first thing we would always say was in, we'd introduce ourselves and I'd go, hi there, I'm assuming you've got your IT support covered. And they'd go, yes, thank you very much, Anthony, I have. As if that's going to get rid of me. And I'd go, fantastic, <laughs> I expected that to be the case. We just wanted to get on your radar because, and this is what, and that's how we would get into it. And then I'd go, so if you don't mind me asking, when does your contract come up for renewal? Because you definitely don't want to talk about it until that's getting close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just get straight to the point. Because otherwise they're going to say, well, I'm in a contract. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. Um, so if you can say, uh, the, one of the most powerful things you can do on the phone is say what somebody's thinking. Um, yeah. And and when you start talking the same language, you can feel them get involved in the conversation. Um, yeah. yeah, so those yeah. are fantastic pieces, fantastic pieces of advice for anybody who is, uh, who is cold calling today. So I, I, I really encourage people to put those to work. Okay, in the last few moments we have here, Anthony, I wanted to give you a chance to tell people a little bit more about yourself, how they can contact you and, uh, and learn more about what you do and your services. Okay, fantastic. Um, obviously, they can visit the website. You can check out thetelephoneassassin.com uh, or anthonysteers.co.uk. Um, put Telephone Assassin in Google, you'll find me. Um, you can phone me up. Obviously, I've got phone numbers all over the place. I love chatting to people. Feel free to email me as well, but I will often make people wait a little bit longer for a response, um, whereas I always tend to pick up the phone. If I'm not on stage or on the phone, I'll answer my phone. Um, so, yeah, people can get in touch. Generally, I split my time between uh, speaking and training. So if you've got conferences, AGMs, uh, I love to come along and do keynotes. If I get involved in those sorts of events, if I'm honest, I like to ask if I can do a breakout session as well so I can sort of roll up our sleeves and interact a bit more. Um, but I also come in and deliver uh, training sessions and just show people how to get stay in control of their calls um, and increase conversions uh, and results. So people can look me up online. Obviously, I love to chat to people. So so uh, feel free to pick up the phone. That's great. Uh, listen, thanks, Anthony. And I'd love you to come back sometime soon and talk about uh, your other, the other part about service driving sales, because uh, that's a piece, you know, dear to our hearts here. So I'd love you to yeah. come back and talk about that some other time. Fantastic. I'd love to. Love okay. to. Okay. Great. Uh, so my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline at CRM. Thanks to Anthony Sears for a great session this morning and I think some great insights into cold calling. And I encourage you to check out more about Anthony. Thank you. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.